And we are live. Welcome, folks, to part five of the Permaculture as a Design Science Introduction to Permaculture series. Uh, this, of course, is a series that I did a few years ago when I have renovated and made it all new with uh, audiovisual support. And we're running through it again with things that I've added since we started out. This is episode 3073 of the Survival Podcast. I do do a podcast for those that maybe found this from some other route than knowing about me. And if you want to be able to listen to the audio version of this, you can do that by going to the survivalpodcast.com. There'll be a link in the video notes right down there. And uh, if you click that link about one hour after the live version ends, then that page will be up with all the resources, the reading materials, everything that I'm going to give you guys today. If you have not uh, heard or watched parts one, two, three, and four, you may want to do that before you go into this one. Today, we're focusing on the thing that I think will help the vast majority of people that listen to my podcast and uh, people that investigate permaculture in general, because we're talking about the kind of property that, well, 80 to 85 percent of people in uh, the Western world live on relatively small, 0.1 to one acre uh, properties, urban, suburban style properties. And if you're like, but that's not me, I have 9 million acres, good for you. And it, you still should have a zone one and we're going to manage the zone one of a large property the same way that we manage uh, the, uh, the entire property of a smaller urban property. It's also, and this is why I say you might want to go back and listen to the previous episodes, it is going to draw heavily from those. There's a lot of things in this episode. I'm going to assume that you know, uh, and I'm going to not go deeper into, hey, this is what a wicking bed is. I'm going to talk about maybe how a wicking bed fits into this type of design. Uh, we're going to try to tie everything together today, and I also have a couple of video clips for you. And if you're listening to the audio version, during those video clips, I'm going to skip right over them because they are so visually centric that I think if you're hearing them on the audio, it's not really going to help. I will have a link to the video version of this, and I'll give you the timestamps even of where you can jump right to those videos. Maybe I'll e even upload those shorts to a separate location for you as well, maybe over on Odyssey. All right, so what are we going to do today? We Again, we're going to dig into this, and we're going to do it from a standpoint of looking at smaller properties. And uh, we're talking about techniques, tactics, and principles for small properties. So we, especially in episodes one and two, the first two, we really dug deep into design concepts and the overall discipline of permaculture. And if you remember, I told you there was a reason that we didn't really talk about techniques and tactics until the third one. And that's because people often confuse technique and tactics. So even though I said to go back and listen, and I'm assuming that you did, I'm going to reiterate, if you get married to techniques and tactics, absent of the discipline of design, and you start confusing, well, permaculture is a swale instead of permaculture is a discipline with swales as a design element that can be used as a technique tactically employed, you run into all kinds of problems, right? So we are going heavy into techniques and tactics and principles today. Principles generally don't get you into trouble. Boy, can techniques and tactics get you into trouble if you're not careful. The type of property that we're talking about today, and again, uh, on a large property, you might break off a piece about this size and make it your zone one of design if you are in a larger property, but from a tenth to an acre. And in polling my audience over the years, as many people as I have that really want to live out in the sticks or have a bigger property or even a mid-size property like I do. I have a three-acre property, and it's right at what I call the urban rural fringe. To me, that is the sweet spot. The reality is the vast majority of homeowners own small holdings, somewhere between a tenth of an acre, which is a really small piece of land, up to about an acre. And the average size of most urban lots is somewhere right around a quarter acre. And a lot of people feel that that's not enough. It is enough. It can plumb wear you out. And if maximized, it can totally feed a family of four to six. Now, I don't mean every scrap of food you're going to want. What I mean is that which you can produce, you will be able to produce in, in abundance beyond what you can consume. So that means you'll have surplus to share 
or surplus to monetize in some way, and then you can apply that towards the things that you can't produce. Um, and there's some major advantages to small properties. And, and here's just a couple of them. One, if you have a quarter acre property and your soil is complete crap, you can absolutely, with a little bit of effort and contacting like tree trimmers and what have you, put six, 10 inches of mulch on your entire property. I mean, from the curb to the back fence and everything in between. I'm not saying everybody should do that. I'm saying you can. And if you own three acres, it ain't happening. Unless you can get every tree trimmer place on the planet or, or in your area dropping off and you get yourself a little bobcat or like a number two John Deere or something, you're not going to do that. So that small land can have major intensive soil management uh, in, in a bunch of ways. Most people that have urban lots, um, I would say most, but many people that have urban lots have complete irrigation systems installed. Uh, when the home was built or the first homeowner, if you're not the first homeowner, will often install, you know, a grass irrigation system. Well, if you have that already, then there's nothing you put in that can't be irrigated immediately. So all we have to do when we put in beds and things like that is make sure we don't mess up the infrastructure that's running that sprinkler system. And it also means that we can irrigate the entire property. Again, I don't see most people ever irrigating a multi-acre property uh, fully. We have to spot irrigate. But with a small property, we can irrigate the entire landscape. Do you want to know why that is a, a big deal? When you irrigate a spot, and, and I do it, and we have to at times, the problem is you wet an area, and it's surrounded by dryness. And then osmosis kicks in, and all that water that you put in that area begins to be absorbed by the surrounding landscape. So if you think about it, if you take a pan full of water, and you put a sponge in it, that sponge will get soaking wet. But if you put a dry sponge on top of the wet sponge, the top sponge will suck some of the water up. And you can put 10 sponges there. That's what the land's doing. So there's really a case to be made for fully irrigating the majority of a property. And again, if we are smart and we break down to like a half acre zone one, even though we can't irrigate a larger property, we can completely irrigate that property if it makes sense for us. And there's a lot of other advantages. When you're on these small properties, generally you have neighbors. I know some of those neighbors are Karens and you don't really want to have them. But the reality is you have a lot of resources available. Um, it's actually difficult for me to get, for instance, bagged up leaves here. I've even put a thing out on next door saying, hey, if you have bagged up leaves and, you know, your garbage man's not going to take all of it in one go. As long as there's not other garbage in there, you can literally pull up to my fence and throw bags of leaves over my fence. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody And I see people all the time like, I don't know how to get rid of my leaves. You can bring them here. They don't want to move them. They don't want to put any effort into it. If you live in a neighborhood, you can literally at leaf raking time, walk around, talk to your neighbors and pick up bags of leaves. Now you've got compost, you've got mulch, you've got a fungal inoculum because like things like uh, oak leaf fungus are incredible soil additives. And it just keeps going from there. Right. So I just want you to understand that a lot of people think, well, I am at a disadvantage because I'm on a small property. There's a lot of advantages and we could keep going, but we won't. I think you'll discover them for yourself as we go through today's presentation. Um, next, this is where the greatest opportunity to transform our society is because it's where the most people are. So if we teach this and we stop making everybody think that they need to go to this, you know, massive off grid 25 acre, 2000 acre, whatever it is in people's head. And we're going to grow all our own food. And we start teaching people right there in your backyard, we can transform things. Then we start to make the maximum impact for the least amount of leverage. And that's a principle we'll hit today. I do have some book recommendations for you today and links to all these books will be available in the audio notes which will be available about an hour after the live stream ends in the link that's down there right below the video. They are Retro Suburbia by David Holgram. David was the co-founder of Permaculture along with Bill Mollison. This is a thick, dense book. If you're the kind of person that you really dig reading things like Bill Mollison's Barking Frogs transcripts, the Permaculture Designer's Manual, Permaculture 1 and Permaculture 2, and you read that without your eyes just glossing over, you're going to love Retro Suburb Suburbia. If you struggle getting through even one segment of the designer's manual, you'll struggle a little bit with retro suburbia as well, but not as much. It's a little more approachable, but it's a thick, dense, design-centric book. 
It's expensive if you want the printed copy delivered to your house so you can smack gangly and sis with it or whatever. If you will uh, happily indulge yourself with the electronic version, David will sell it to you for whatever amount you, you think it's worth. Five bucks, a dollar, three dollars, whatever you think it's worth. Value for value exchange. I have a link to that. Next, and probably the most approachable book in permaculture and ideal for this mindset, Guy's Garden by Toby Hemingway. Uh, Toby Hemingway was a dear friend of mine. I, I hated losing him to cancer like we did, but I am grateful that he's got some great books. And for this stuff, Guy's Garden, man, I'm telling you, there's so many people who told me they got that book and it's really all they need to be able to plan out and design this type of property. Then the next book I've mentioned before is called Paradise Lot by Jonathan Bates and Eric Tosenmeyer. Um, this is a book that definitely, if you're a Kindle person, you can get the Kindle version, you'll lose nothing. There's not a lot of graphics or anything in the book. Uh, so there's no reason to pay twice as much for the print book unless you just want it that way. And again, I'll have links to all of these in the subject line. With that, I wanna remind you as we're going through this today, if you have questions for me, uh, anything you want me to comment on, anything you want me to clarify, try to be specific enough that if it's I'm clarifying something and I come back at it 20, 30, 40 minutes later, I'll know what you're talking about. But first couple words, put in all caps. I have a little feature here in StreamYard. I will click a little star next to it. It will go in a list that I will go down through at the end, as you might be accustomed to if you've been tuning in to this before. And I mentioned that David is doing a value for value exchange. During this, if you think, hey, that's really a badass piece of information Jack gave me and you want to tip me, I do have Super Chats enabled and even five bucks helps a lot. So I appreciate it when those come in. With that, let's get back into the presentation. So I mentioned Paradise Lot by Eric Tosenmeyer and Jonathan Bates. And I really love this book. And I think it's one of those great books for people that sometimes struggle with kind of the textbook type thing we were talking about with Retro Suburbia. It's not really a how-to book. It's a what we did book. It's written as a narrative about these two guys that both were like plant geeks and they wanted permaculture property and they didn't have the money to buy a big piece of land. Sound familiar? And what they did was they bought a duplex or what we used to call in the coal region, a half a double. But they bought both sides of it. And like one side was kind of livable and the other needed a lot of work. So they moved in it into the one side and they kind of like lived as roommates while they fixed up the other side. And then, you know, they kind of moved over there and fixed it up. And now I, in, unless something's changed since they wrote the book, they're like both married, they have wives, they each have one side of it. And they took the fence splitting the yards from the two sides down and made one big long strip. And if you're looking at the uh, video right here on the left, you see a dirt lot. That's what it looked like when they moved in. It looked exactly like that. There was no topsoil. They literally scraped off all life forms from the lots when they built these houses. These were new houses. And uh, so there was nothing there. There wasn't, if you look, there's not a blade of grass there. And they went in and did a lot of the types of techniques that we're going to talk about today. They did a ton of mulching, some irrigation, building soil, composting. They used some small livestock. And if you look on the right, that's what it looked like a couple of years into it. These guys were actually to the point where they were making some money by selling perennials. Uh, there's another great book by Eric to Tosenmeyer called Perennial Vegetables. And they were growing a lot of the things that are in that book. And they literally became weeds in this system to where they were pulling them out and selling them as plants and actually just monetizing. Instead of propagating plants for the sake of propagating plants, they were pulling plants out of the ground, putting them in pots and selling them to people who otherwise would be going to somewhere like Oikos tree crops and paying, you know, 20 to 30 bucks a plant. They're selling for five, six bucks, 100% profit. And what that leads us to is what we're really talking about. When we talk about doing permaculture on this scale, we're talking about moving from home to homestead. Now, I've had a couple people already who've said in today's chat, I've been listening to you since like 08 or 2010. If, if so, then you know that this is one of the foundational things that I built all of the survival podcast on. That our ancestors, your grandparents and back, most of that generation and back, even when they lived on small properties, they did this type of thing. They created hus side hustles and revenue sources and they grew food and they treated their property like a little farm in some way, shape or form. They, they kept some chickens. They did something. 
And, and, and it's because that is what this entire continent was basically founded on. When people first came to North America, there was no American flag. There was no Pledge of Allegiance. That didn't happen until the turn of the last century, by the way. Um, a lot of these ideals that we've been brought up in our civics classes with, when we used to have civics class, if you're my age, that we, we tend to then just complete fill in the blank for ourselves, think this is what brought people to America. It isn't. The real thing that brought people to America in the late 17 and through the 1800s was you could own land. Whether it was a little piece like this or a great big piece, you could own land. There was a lot of places in the world, unless you were a royal or a noble, you weren't going to ever own land. And so people came here to homestead. The, we talk about World War II generation being the greatest generation. And I think they had to have incredible courage to do what those men did. Um, but to me, the greatest generation is the homesteading generation of the, in fact, multiple homesteading generations of the 1800s that packed up a wagon and went west and then went to some place that was basically, you know, a lumpy, rocky, treed area and carved out an existence there on four to 40 acres. Uh, and that was a total family effort. That was mom, dad, the kids, grandpa, et cetera. And so we can learn from that. And it's actually easier to do today. So that's what we're really talking about here is going from home to homestead. And uh, again, I just want to go over the advantages we have of zone one design or small properties. Again, some real quick ones before we get into these techniques. You can mulch and irrigate everything. That's a huge advantage. You can build the most productive soil in the world. I'm going to show you a clip later today if you're in the video version that will show you exactly how that can be done. Starting with gravel and, and dirt that you have to break apart with a hammer. I mean lumps of dirt that like you can't break with your hands. You have to smash them with a hammer and turn it into soil that's so fertile the people analyzing it call you up excited. Really, I'm going to show you that happen uh, at, at Rob Avis's property in, in Canada today. It forces you to think about every decision. You can't be wasteful. And you find on larger properties, you take a lot of things for granted. Um, on small properties, you think a lot more. There's more restrictions on the design, so the design becomes more elegant. Uh, your system ends up very easy to maintain because you can see, touch, and, and, and handle everything, and you rarely get in over your head. I've definitely gotten in over my head on even a three-acre property. The truth here, though, is everything I'm going to show you today, you already know how to do. Everything we're going to talk about today is an aid to human beings. I believe that human beings are natural, native species to planet Earth because that's scientifically true. We are not some alien invader of this planet. We co-evolved with all of life on this planet, and we co-evolved as a horticultural species, a species that walked alongside animal and plant and learned how through observation and trial and error to make the two work together. That's what permaculture really is. Now, somewhere along the way, it all went wrong. And it was about the time that we figured out how to mechanize plows, even with a horse pulling it or an ox pulling it. When we really mechanized, when we met, we had our first combines that could cut an entire field in a tenth of the time it used to take people to do with scythes, even before gas, Aline and, and, and Petro, when it was just a horse pulling. That's about the time it really, now we had already had some agricultural things going back into Egypt and stuff where we drained rivers, we cut down forests, but when we mechanized it, it really went wrong because it didn't just go wrong with the areas that it was done at the industrial scale. It went, it got scalable outward and we stopped doing these things. And then it went wrong everywhere all at the same time. And a lot of the ecological problems that we have today, I'm going to tell you, the, the people that are worried about pollution and carbon and on and on and on, the most pollution-producing enterprise on planet Earth today is agriculture. And those of you that think it's fossil fuels, that has a lot to do with it. Because look how much fossil fuel goes into to conventional ag today. From a standpoint of harvest, plowing, all of the, the fuel we burn, transport, etc., but also in the production of chemical fertilizers and herbicides. It is a nasty, dirty business. And doing the things we're talking about today, take pressure off that system. And boy, do we need to because we're going into more and more food shortages uh, and, and, and all types of problems that are being that, like basically modern agriculture is a mining uh, operation. 
it's not farming anymore. It's mining. And you can only mine something into the point where you've depleted it. And you it looks really productive until you hit a point where the, the unsustainable nature becomes evident, and we're hitting that now. Let's get into some of the things that you can consider doing. I want to point out that not everything I'm giving you today is something that everybody should do. Um, if you look at one of the techniques I'm about to go through and think, I don't want to do that, don't do that. It's okay. But I want you to be aware of it. I want you to be aware of it, and I want you to understand it enough so that if you say, I don't want to do this, it's not because, gee, I don't want to learn how to do that. Looks well, complicated and hard. Or, oh, that's good for other people, but it won't work for me. Most of these techniques can work everywhere if they're adapted properly. Um, but if you don't want to do them, you don't want to do them. Or if they don't fit your overall design, that's fine. But what I want you to do, imagine today you're painting a picture, and it's your picture. And you choose what you're going to pick, what you're going to paint. It could be a landscape that you want to paint to look like the landscape you're looking at. It could be a landscape that you create in your mind. It could be a, a bowl of fruit, like a still life. You could paint everything really representative of what a person sees in their eyes. You could do it more abstract. You can change color schemes. You can do whatever you want. But over here, you have this incredible assortment of uh, pencils and, and, and watercolors and, and, and charcoals and all these different things that you can use from your palette on your canvas. And I want you to be aware of all of the things you could choose so that you actually end up making what you want. So I want to start off with aquaponics. And this is something that people often, you know, is it really permaculture? Well, can you do this in a way that helps you take responsibility for yourself and that of your children and tick the box of the prime directive. Yep. Uh, can you do this without harming the earth? Tick the box. Yes. Can you do this without harming people? Yep. Tick the box. Yes. So to me, it's, it's absolutely a permaculture methodology. It's also highly productive. Those that can see the image here, you're looking at one 50 gallon uh, Rubbermaid stock tank. That's an ebb and flow bed in my greenhouse. This system has been completely redesigned at this point, And that, that bed has moved elsewhere, but you can see it is incredibly productive. There's there's 20 different plants growing in there. There's watercress coming out the front. There's green onions. There's uh, some brassias in there. There's some uh, uh, bloody dock back there in the corner. There's lettuces coming up in the center. Uh, there's dill growing in the center. I mean, I can't even, I, I, I took the picture. I grew it and I can't tell you everything that's in that one uh, tray. The key I want you to understand about aquaponics is one of the reasons that people have such a negative view of it is the people that package it, market, and sell it lie. And they lie because they know what you want. And what most people that do aquaponics really want to focus on is I get fish, I get meat. And that makes sense because it's one of the more difficult things, at least in our minds, to produce, especially on small properties. Aquaponics is not, is not, is not, 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 not a fish production system. It is a fish management system that results in a vegetative productive system with fish as a small byproduct. And unless we're pushing at least 300 gallons in our sump, our, our lowest tank in the system where we're actually growing our fish, we're not even going to get much fish out of it. The most productive fish for aquaponics are goldfish. They're cheap. When they die, you don't care. You bury them in uh, your regular gardens and they become fertilizer. You're not going to eat them. It doesn't matter. You don't care. If you end up with a, a die-off, you go down to the pet store with 10 bucks and you buy, you know, 100 more goldfish from the feeder section. And, and that's just wonderful for this production. When it comes to growing fish that you can eat, if you can heat your water, if you can keep it warm, it, you can even do your fish inside and your aquaponics, your, your garden stuff on the outside, you know, like in, a, in an outbuilding that's heated. It's very difficult to beat tilapia. Tilapia are probably your best fish for this. Uh, they produce a lot of waste. They can handle really foul water, and they don't eat each other, especially if you get them all the same size at the same time. And I can tell you that the white Nile tilapia, which may not be legal in some areas, but who's going to know? It's up to you. Uh, can handle down to below 50 degrees of temperature. They get really slow at that point. They don't eat anymore, and it's okay. But... When they get down into the 40s, they just go to sleep. And if it gets much colder, they die. And so I've done that. I actually had them when the water hit like 
These were well adapted, large white Nile tilapia. Water hit 39 degrees, and they went from sitting there not moving vertical to laying flat on the bottom of the tank. I filled up a 300-gallon stock tank in my garage, did my indoor aquaponics uh, project that year, went out with a dip net, dipped up every one of those fish laying flat on the ground, which made it easy. Drop, didn't do any adjustment, dropped them straight into hose temperature water, which was in the 60s. Within five minutes, they were all swimming around. They all lived all through the winter. So they are incredibly hardy. And they are good eating fish. People say they're bland. Then you don't know how to cook. Tilapia tastes like however you cook it. Probably your other two best food fish are going to be bullhead catfish and, and any kind of sunfish, specifically bluegill. But you really need an aquaponic systems to make sure you're starting with fish all the same size because they will beat each other up and eat each other. The big thing with aquaponics, though, is it teaches you so much. You can propagate with it. It has a tremendous amount of advantage, and that's one of the reasons I recommend people at least consider it and learn more about it. Next is wicking beds. Now, wicking beds are something I've talked about in the third episode, the fourth episode, and now the fifth episode. And, and so you may be thinking, you know, Jack, you, just, you keep talking about these wicking beds, man. Like, let's do something new. When I keep bringing something back, there is a reason. There's a reason. When it comes to small scale systems, backyard systems, urban suburban systems, intensive zone one systems, the wicking bed is your friend. The wicking bed, and if we look at the one that I have here for you in the picture, th that's a Lanacito kale, and that's a flow through bed. That's on one of my pond systems that's up on the rail. And that just goes off. That's one of those systems that goes off once a day for 15 minutes. The water runs through it. Make sure it's topped off, stops, doesn't water till the next day. You can't mess this up. It's not going to overwater because you set your, your, your depth in your wicking bed at the depth that you want. It never dries out because it always is recharged every day. And that means that worms are happy. Your biology is happy. Your fungus is happy. Your beneficial bacteria are happy. You pop some beneficial nematodes in there. And then pests are miserable, soil pests are miserable because the beneficial nematodes are eating them and boring into their bodies and destroying them like some kind of horrific science fiction film. And this is the kind of growth you get. And if you look at the, the kale there, it's been harvested and harvested and harvested. You can see where it's been cut and come again and cut and come again and cut and come again. I really, really, and I mean really, right? Like just to be clear, recommend you get wicking beds into your design on some level. If you're doing aquatics, aquaponics, or just plain container gardening, make sure you're using wicking beds because what you end up doing is you get soil the way you want it and it never dries out. And there's some other advantages to wicking beds no one talks about. So I wanted to give them to you today as like a bonus since we've talked about them a lot already. One, you reach the end of your season. There's some grasses and weeds and things that are beginning to grow in your wicking beds. You're about to put your bed to sleep for the winter. You do this before it fully freezes, though, because you're going to want to drain it before a full freeze comes. Whatever you're doing to set the level in your wicking bed with your overflow, raise it so that you can fill the tub almost all the way to the surface. Fill it with water, however you want to do that. Leave it sit for a couple of days and then drain it out. You just destroyed most of your weeds by drowning them the same way you do in a rice paddy. Real simple to do. If you do like over the winter season, let it dry out and you're having trouble because we've all had this soil. When it dries out, it becomes hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't want to get wet. You water it. The water goes straight through to the bottom and then the, your, your upper soil lever just won't get moist for you. And I'm sure all of us have experienced that one way or another. You see it sometimes with like a bag of potting soil that gets left aside for a season. And when you open it, it just won't get wet. Do the same thing. Raise the level in it, saturate the soil, this time for a couple, three minutes, then drain it out. If you have to do it twice, you have to do it twice. I had a bed that went dry on me this winter, and because the bottom fell off of the overflow height, and it completely drained out, and it took you know a matter of minutes to rehydrate it. That's an incredibly valuable thing as well. So I want to throw that in for you guys today. Next, small-scale earthworks. Small-scale earthworks are hugely overlooked on small design. This looks rather large, and this area is like a zone to um, orchard at this point. 
But this could have been an annual garden bed if you wanted to be. In fact, you see the first bed in the picture is all planted to annuals at that point. And basically, that's what I did. I ran it as a garden for a season, and then I planted trees in it that fall. And that's what it's evolved into. If you've seen other videos of mine, this is the orchard with the arch that made up the thumbnail of uh, today's video uh, down toward the center of my backyard. But what that was designed to do is if you look, those berms are all on contour and the paths between them are on contour and to the left of the screen so you can see where there's a hose bib there a little pipe coming up that way is upgrade so water flows from from that side down to that system and then it spreads and soaks into the ground those are also hoogles so that was dug out with an excavator uh wood was placed in the ditches and then the dirt was returned to form the burns. But that is a water harvesting system. This is the most drought resistant place on my property right now. It doesn't hurt that just to the other side, just to to um, to that side, everything's backwards on StreamYard, just to that side. That's where my leach field is for my septic. So the septic is also leaching and then coming downgrade into the system because Water always moves at right angle to contour, even below grade, meaning water will continue to flow through the landscape even once it's absorbed going downhill into the system. It basically creates its own aquifer. And, and this is just a fantastic, easy way to do things. And I have a video co segment coming for you here in a moment that will take this to a complete different level. But the reason we don't do this is everybody landscapes in North America or gardens in North America on right angles. Instead of right angle to contour, we go right angle to fences, right angle to houses. So we put the garden in a straight line lining up with the fence. We plant trees going down our fence line. We have a sidewalk, so the sidewalk is straight, so we plant straight along it. Curves not only look better and soften angles and have more eye appeal, when we curve into a landscape, we can channel and control the flow of water through the system. This will become more clear when I run the clip for you, so I'll skip for now. Next, this is a huge thing and a huge opportunity in an urban environment. Since you don't have that much land to irrigate, some water catchment goes a long way. Now, I want to talk about water catchment in a couple different ways here. So what you're looking at there is a tank. It's on the back of one of my shop buildings. It's a metal roof, so it's great clean water that comes off that roof. That's a 1,500-gallon tank. It's actually on level and plumb with another tank you can't see on the back side of that building. There's a piece of two-inch that connects them, so they fill evenly, and they distribute water from them evenly, and they have a cutoff valve. Always put cutoff valves in your system. They're expensive, but only once, and you can use them over and over again, like when you get a busted pipe on one side but not the other, and you can save water, or you need to work on one side but not the other, and you don't want everything to drain out, et cetera. Um, but that's 3,000 gallons of water. Now, with 3,000 gallons of water, even in a low rain climate like we have for a lot of the year, you can totally water a very large garden 90% or more of its needs. So that's good. You can take 10 IBCs, 300-gallon-ish IBCs, and end up with somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 gallons, depending on the size of the IBCs. Those are international bulk containers, the big white square tanks. And you can collect enough water to do the same thing. What you can't do is make any meaningful contribution in the world of water catchment with a rain barrel you spend $100 for to hold 50 gallons of water at Home Depot and Lowe's. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Do not do it. Do not spend that kind of money. Now, there's those blue barrels. We'll see them used for container gardenings that can be anywhere between 15 and 50 gallons. Those big, and a lot of times you can get those really, really inexpensively. Those are fine if you plumb enough of them together. But unless you're getting at least into the 500 gallon water range on catchment, you're not really doing anything. Now, we can use, we're going to see in this video segment a small barrel used to capture overflow and recharge a small pond. That's a different thing. I'm talking your primary water catchment. If you're going to do this, catch enough water for it to matter. If you don't catch enough water for it to matter, you're wasting your time and you're probably going to overflow at your foundation of your home and cause problems for yourself. So rainwater catchment, yes. Small catchment, no. 
Now, why do we want to do this? Let's we just said we can irrigate the whole property. Okay, I don't I don't overreact to this. And I've grown some great gardens on city water. But city water is going to have chlor chlorine and or chloramine in it. And this is not the most beneficial thing for your plants or the life in your soil. And chlorine, of course, kills microorganisms. So I look at water when it comes to irrigation with a hierarchy. And that means that I'm not going to be afraid of using city water if that's what I'm stuck with. I'm going to use it because a live plant is more productive than a dead one or a dying one. But if I have my choice, the best water I can get comes from rain. And there's a lot of reasons I won't go into, but it does have to do with that water falling through the atmosphere and, and being charged up to a degree. The next would be water from a pond system. Then would be water from a well. And then would be water from a city system. And the first three, sorry for the bang on the microphone there, guys. The first three are about equal. There's only a little bit of hierarchy between them. I'm just as happy to use pond water. In some cases, pond water is better because it has nutrient coming along with it, right? I'm just as happy to use well water as I am pond water. And I'm just as happy to use rainwater as all three, but rain would be best. So by going with rain catchment, we are, we are going to a point where we're getting the best water for our plants. And if you take and you look at, because I've, I've done tests where you water one garden with rainwater and one garden with city water, and you manage them the same, and you put the same crops in, they get the same exposure, you're going to see a difference, a, a noticeable difference. Again, it doesn't mean that your, your city water garden is going to be ass, and it's going to suck, and you're going to die if you eat the carrots out of it or whatever, and it won't be very productive from you for you. It just means you'll see better results. So that's one of the big reasons that we want to think about rain catchment. And another thing we really want to think about, and this all ties together, and I'm about to show you this amazing clip, uh, are garden ponds. Now, for those that can see the video here, I've talked about tire ponds. And you might think a tire pond sounds really ugly. You're looking at one. That is a pond built with a tractor tire. Big tractor tire. That pond's big. One thing you'll notice about little ponds when you put them in your landscape. If you take a form, like a preform or anything that represents the size of the pond, and you look at it before you put it in the ground, it will look big. And when you put it in the ground, it will appear to shrink. Uh, that's a fairly substantial pond. You can grow a lot in a pond that size. Are you going to grow fish in that pond? No. Now, I would throw gambrosia, which are mosquito fish in there to keep the mosquito population down. And I might throw some uh, goldfish in there. It depends on what I'm going to do with it, how I'm going to aerate it, what have you. The main thing I want out of this, though, I want habitat. Uh, I'm going to probably grow Chinese water chestnut or taro or arrow, uh, arrowhead, which is duck potato, or something that I can consume in this pond. I would probably grow watercress in this pond as well. I'm also making habitat for frogs. I have a, fr I have a friend, a family friend, that... They have like a yuppie backyard. It's almost all pool deck, little hill with some red tip bushes in it, but they like water features. They put in like a 200 gallon prefab pond, like the liners, the, the rigid liners that you buy uh, from like Home Depot and Lowe's. And they put a little waterfall in it, put a pump in it, recirculating it. And somebody bought this gentleman uh, a toad house, which is just basically a cool looking flower pot with a hole in it with a frog on it. That's like they're decorative. So he puts it in and it ends up being one of those things. Like he's not, he's this guy's former Marine, right? Really cool dude. Uh, retired Marine actually. And you wouldn't think he'd get all up in the jazz about toad houses, but something about it hit him and it became a thing. They started collecting them. So everybody they knew, because it's hard to find certain people gifts, like, but he likes toad houses. So it's what he collects. So people started bringing him toad houses and he started, when they go on vacation, they'd find a toad house. It's a thing. You can look them up. And all of a sudden they start seeing tadpoles in the little pond. So we went and visited them. This is years ago, by the way, uh, about a year after this all started. And I noticed like the toad houses are gone. And I said, what happened with the toad houses? He said, well, 
the pond and the toad houses brought so many toads. And this is the middle of like a yuppie suburb. There were so many toads here. We couldn't sleep in the springtime. The noise of the toads was echoing through the house, through the walls and the windows at night. And we had to knock down the toad population because there were too many. How many pests do you think are in a garden running a system like that? Pretty cool, huh? So there's a lot with habitat. You also have things like lizards can live in the rocks there and get something to drink. Dragonflies and predators and bees. One of the biggest things, people are always thinking, how can I attract bees? What, what flowers and flowering plants and herbs? Great, you should do that. But one of the things bees really struggle with is getting water. In a lot of our climates, there's not a lot of surface water. So if we have floating vegetation like azolla or water hyacinth or something like that, and we have water uh, if, that, that, that's floating on, what that allows those insects, those bees, and other beneficials to do is land on the vegetation and obtain water. And you'll end up with entire swarms of bees around your ponds and wasps as well. Um, we used to notice that before I put all the ponds in, when we were swimming in the pool in the summertime, these big red wasps, they call them paper wasps, would come land on the pool and stratton. Like the way they put their legs out, they can actually float and they would drink water out of the pool. Well, they're getting, you know, pool water. We see a lot less of them since we put the ponds in because it's easier for them to access and there's less risk with trying to float on the pool and they, they bother us less. So there's a tremendous uh, boost to beneficials when you do this. And again, that one's built with a tire. Uh, I think I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. We're going to go back on that. I've got a uh, clip. This is out of Jeff Lawton's Urban Permaculture DVD that was put out years ago. This is about a four or five minute segment. If you are on the audio, I'm going to go ahead and turn things off now because I don't think you'll benefit from it as much. Uh, and this will give me a, a, a good break for my voice here while you guys get to look at this. I want you to look at the fact that we just went through, let me back up. We went through small scale earthworks. We went through rainwater catchment. And we went through garden ponds. And you're about to see all three of those elements and some other ones folded together in one of the most brilliant pieces of urban suburban design I've ever seen by this, this woman uh, out of Australia that Jeff featured in this DVD. And I have to say the, the Australians, because permaculture originated there, are miles ahead of us when it comes to this urban suburban design so check this out and you guys start you know comment to me while you're watching this how many connections how many things how many things that we've talked about do you see and what light bulbs does this turn on for you well here we are in the suburbs it's just really a, a lawn mowing time wasting money gobbling environmental and economical disaster it's really quite disappointing. This is a nature strip system. It's called a green strip in America. It's only America, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia that have nature strips. And if we actually converted the lawns that we don't use and the nature strips that we don't use in a city, we could feed a city with the same amount of energy that's poured into this money-wasting, time-consuming nightmare of a system. This over here, now this is something interesting. This is the front garden, and this is almost totally a foodscape. It's a water-wise garden, and this footpath is deep mulched on top of newspaper, so that nothing's gonna grow in here, it's just a functional footpath access way. But it's perfectly on contour, so it harvests water, and soaks it passively to the lower beds. So there's functional relationships, water harvesting relationships. It's definitely considered a water-wise foodscape. This is the type of design elements we have to include in all our designs so we get the best result, minimum input, maximum output. So we have a water tank here. This catches the roof water. And so we've got clean rainwater, good drinking water if we want. Overflow from this goes to supply the garden as well, right to the top of the garden. Overflow from this tank goes to a little barrel that starts the process of water filtration through this very water-wise garden. Here's our water barrel, barrel nicely concealed in the, in the hedge. This is 
fed from the water tank that catches water off the roof. And this is the overflow. It can be fed into the pond, it can be fed into the garden. Everything's supporting everything else. There's a lovely little frog pond here with a zola, and a nice little branch in position so it's frog friendly. Frogs can come in and out. Habitat, and there's food everywhere. Here's some nice hot chilies. There's some pak choy. There's scented uh, pennyroyal there. There's a nice big beetroot here. In fact, there's a lot of beetroot through the garden. So we have contour layers designed into the garden so the water slowly soaks through. We end up in this lower section. We've got a pond here, little pump reticulating water with solar power from the panels on the roof. And we can also connect up the roof water from the gutter on this side into the pond as part of the water supply. In the pond, we've got Chinese water chestnut, which is the most productive crop in the world by weight. And we have a Vietnamese mint, as well as other ornamental plants and our mulch azola as well. Overflow from this pond carries on and feeds further on down the garden. That when we put the swales in, about a week after, we had a tremendous storm. And I was down the backyard and got caught in it. And um, down came the rain and I turned around and the swales had filled. And I was just so excited. I went, look, they do work. And then the water just soaked into the Once I got the earthworks in, measured where the contours were, and I've got swales in the backyard as well, the design just fell into place around it. The back garden. Here we have an overflow from the grey water of the house, comes through a little sloping reed bed into an aerating pond right behind me. The overflow comes through the swale I'm sitting in and down almost the full length of the garden, soaks through the swale mound, and any overflow from that gets caught in the next swale further down. Here we have our, our top swale in the back garden. It overflows at this point here, comes down here, and spreads into this swell. This swell stretches right around the raised garden pond and soaks all that water into the lowest part of the garden. And this beautiful fragile hedge on the bottom of the garden, soaking the water into the lowest point as the final potential point of exit if it hasn't already been used already. So, for the for those of you on the uh, audio only, I, again, I cut that out, but I'll, I'm going to be talking about it, and I think it'll be uh, it'll be a useful discussion, and it will make sense with the discussion. Um, that system is beautifully designed, and it's amazing to me how people think earthworks don't apply on land that's flat or small. And when you look at that, you see that coming straight out from the front of the property. All the paths are on contour. All the paths channel the water that's caught in the in the catchment tank to things like the small garden ponds and distribute it through the entire property. Somebody made an interesting comment when it comes to pollution um, and reducing pollution in, in a system like this. Uh, Christopher said, you know, there's no need to mow. Two cycle motors are very uh, polluting. But also mowing takes time. Mowing is a destructive thing the way that we do, and uh, it, mostly in urban, suburban environments. And how much effort goes into maintaining lawns? It's an insane amount of uh, effort in, in maintaining lawns. And Chris also says that all that shade is gold in hot climates, and that's true. And that's something you have to think about in your design decisions, right? So I want to maximize shade to a point almost across the board in what I do in Texas. Even things that need a lot of sun, I want them either to get late day or early day sun, and early day is better. I want at some point during the day, end of the day, et cetera, I want them in shade. I want them resting because it's so much heat and so much sun, and a plant can only take in so much light and use so much light before it exceeds its capacity to be actually begins to damage it. Uh, radiation is, solar radiation is good, but it can be like anything, the, the poison is in the dose. Uh, whereas in northern climate, you might want to invite more of that solar energy in. But to me, that is a fantastic way to understand the integration of systems, including things like 
The little garden pond is growing azola. Azola is a nitrogen-fixing aquatic fern. That's what it is. It reproduces very quickly, and it likes that dappled shade. If it gets too much sun, it will turn black, and it will die on you. It doesn't like to be too hot. So you have it in this dappled, shaded little pond area. Your frogs are hanging out. And once that azola, and if you saw when Jeff went to pick it up, it was very, a very thick mat of azola. So you can go in every day and take a big couple handfuls out and mulch it around your annuals, for instance, in your gardens. And you're giving it mulch. You're giving it water. You're giving it nutrient. You're giving it a nitrogen kick. All right. And you're building soil. And you know what happens? Very quickly, that Azola, re it's not as fast as duckweed, but it's very, very quick in reproducing as well. So that is just a fantastic, um, just a fantastic example of how these things stack together. And if you didn't get to see it, it's probably worth, you know, coming by and finding the video. And I've made a decision. I'm going to upload this and another, the other short clip that I have onto my Odyssey channel. I'll add that to the uh, podcast notes on the audio version, though it might not be there early today. It might be a little bit later in the day before I get those uploaded and uh, uh, rendered out on Odyssey for you. Moving on, I want to talk about this little technique. I already taught you about backyard orcharding, where we take trees, of larger size than, than, than typical rootstock for backyards. Maybe we plant four really close to each other and we manage it like a shrub and we prune it to the size of a shrub and we extend our season. This is another option. These are known as spindle or columnar apples. Now you can actually buy apple trees. For instance, rain trees say, sell some that are designed to grow this way. They grow in a big straight line. They don't put out a lot of lateral branches and they fruit along the main trunk. But the reality is um, you don't have to use a columnar apple for that. You can use a regular apple tree. And in general, these are grown in orchards this way intentionally because it's very easy to manage. Uh, you get a lot of airflow around. It's easy to spray, whether you're spraying it organically with things like uh, garlic pepper tea to mitigate insect damage, or if you're doing a conventional orchard, uh, it works well for those guys as well. But to me, this technique of growing these apples, and they'll, you can control life to your choice. In most commercial operations, they're actually grown to about 11 feet in height because they get more vertical production that way. But you can certainly cap them at six, seven, eight feet, somewhere in that nature. And they're generally spaced at two to three feet between the trees, where a full-size apple tree is going to be you know, spaced more along the lines of 20 to 30 feet or more, depending on what the canopy is going to be like in training. And this, to me, screams, plant me along a fence line or a wall. And the way I would make that decision is, where am I? What's my solar aspect? And do I need more or less heat? So if I have the right solar aspect up against a fence, I'm probably not going to get a lot of thermal gain off the fence unless it's a, 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 a brick fence. So maybe in a southern climate, I would be more akin to fence line planting. Or in a northern climate where I want to get early warm up and residual heat off a brick wall, the wall of a home. And wherever it fits for you in your design. But this is an incredible space saving technique. And it lets you do, if you think back to earlier episodes when I showed you kind of the guy in the backyard, 60 square meter backyard, and he was growing apples a lot like this. Um, he was growing three apple trees and he was growing three different apples that come to uh, ripe at three different times to extend his harvest. With this technique, you can take that and put it on steroids. Uh, a, a standard kind of lot that I see a lot of suburban homes built on around here, 60 by 120 feet, 60 foot back fence. Every three feet, what do you got, 20 trees? Maybe it's 18 because you lose your corners if you choose to lose your corners. That's a lot of apple trees. You could even do this planting apples from seed for almost no money. Never know what you're going to get. But almost every apple grown from seed, despite what people tell you that want to sell you grafted trees, will be a tree that will produce an apple that's a good apple for something. Whether that's for making applesauce, whether that's for eating out of hand, whether that's for making apple cider vinegar, whether it's for making hard apple cider, you name it. And all of them will be palatable. You're not going to grow it. I don't care where you get it. You get a seed from any apple 
on the planet that's a good apple to eat and you plant you're not going to get something you can't eat that tastes like crap it's not going to turn it's not going to turn into a crab apple it doesn't work that way that's not how it works whoever told you that stop listening to them but this is definitely a technique to look at for your small backyards next up is trellising and i have two of my favorite crops to trellis in this image uh, on the left, as you're looking at it, you'll see uh, Chinese red noodle beans. And I like all of the Chinese noodle slash long beans. I think they're one of the most fantastic crops out there. I like the red ones better. They don't taste any different. Why do you like them better? I like them better because when they start putting beans on, there's like there's no beans. There's like some little stringies of beans. And then like two days later, there's like a bunch of beans. And, you know, unless you're really paying attention the green ones will grow past their prime and you won't see them, but the red ones show up and you see them. So that's that's the main reason I like the red version better because when you cook them, they turn green. The color cooks right out of them. Um, but they are a fantastic bean. They grow incredibly fast. They produce within 60 days from seed. And what that means, those of you in warm climates, you can actually save and replant and maybe get two or three replantings of selecting seed and replanting for seed saving in a single season. They grow, they love trellises. They have a pretty cool looking little flower on them. They attract a lot of uh, bees and uh, insects and things like that. Someone had asked me in the past, they, they said they had heard that the leaf of Chinese long beans are edible. I haven't tried it and I don't know and I haven't been able to confirm or deny that. If any of y'all know, I'd love to hear from you, but definitely... Uh, is is potentially a additional crop, but I, I'm not advising you to eat them yet because I cannot verify that. The next picture, the one to the right, you see me standing next to a trombuchino squash, and you can see that it's uh, the bottom of it is almost down to my like where my kneecap is, and the top of it's a little bit higher than my head, and it's 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 uh, growing a nice and straight and long. I'm about just about five eleven. So that thing's about four foot long. When I harvested that that particular one that year, uh, it weighed almost 30 pounds, almost 30 pounds. And again, that's growing on a vertical and that particular squash, and I really love this squash, has so many things going for it. Number one, it's a, a cucuberta muscheta species of squash. Uh, there's C. Pipo, there's C. Maxima, there's C. Mixta, and there's C. Uh, th 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 what this one is here, right? And this is the one that's the most resistant to squash vine borers. They get squash vine borers in them every year, and they live anyway. So it's it's highly resistant to vine borers. Number two, if you harvested it right at that point, there, it's not anywhere near done growing yet. It's going to taste like zucchini. In fact, it's known as Trombuschino zucchini. And it's, a, it's getting a little bit big to do that with, but it's still going to be very much a tender um, summer squash variety. When I let them go to the end of the season, they get about twice as big as that. They turn uh, like a pinkish orange, kind of the color of a butternut. They're exactly like a butternut in flavor. Very similar anyway, more like a pumpkinish, like a, a mild tasting pumpkin. So they are a winter squash. Now, if you look at the bottom of that, there's a bulb. That's where the seeds are. And that neck that goes from the top of that bulb all the way up past my head is solid flesh. So even if you use it as zucchini, instead of having all those seeds, you have all flesh in your plants. So these are two great things to trellis, but trellising increases surface area. If you have 10 square feet of grow space, one foot wide, 10 feet long, and you put a six foot trellis up it, you went from 10 square feet to 70. You've increased your square footage by 6x. Think about that. That's huge. That's huge. And in small spaces, we need to maximize everything that we can. Next, I really recommend you encourage beneficial insects. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but your number one way to encourage beneficial insects don't kill them, don't use pesticides that kill insects indiscriminately. I occasionally use a little bit of soap water as a, an insect an insecticide, but I will only use it, I see the insect, I spray the insect, I will not indiscriminately spray that stuff through my systems. I really 
only do that when I have a, a, an acute situation. I really have no desire um, to to do an indiscriminate killing of insects. And if you look at these two pictures, you'll see why. Both of these are from my property. The one on the left is a wonderful little critter known as a praying mantis. And I have those around all the time. I never went to a catalog and bought egg cases or anything like that. I do recommend that you learn what a praying mantis egg case looks like. And you'll, there are different species of mantid. And there's a case that I need to find a picture for you guys. It doesn't really tend to look like what you see when you buy them. That is a mantid case. And if you see them, it almost looks like a scaling or something. And you might be tempted to remove it. Don't. Those are your those are your guys, man. Those are the, your armed warriors that come out and they kill a lot of your pests. And I will also tell you the walking sticks, they're a mantid species and they look pretty harmless and you can pick them up and they crawl up your arm and all, but they eat predators as well. On the right is my favorite. And I mean, my absolute favorite little guys on the property, jumping spiders. And this is a species that I really haven't seen on a lot of other places. I don't know what it's called. They grow about twice the size of your typical little jumping spider. And they look almost like a little mini tarantula. They have a little red dot on their back. For those that don't see it, it's not a black widow. It's not on their ab on the abdomen underneath. This is on their back of their abdomen. Um, they are just cool. Uh, I have them like crazy in all my wicking beds. They really love to hang out there. And you can see that guy right there, or she, that's a girl. She is on a leaf from uh, a brassy. I believe that's either broccoli or kale. I don't remember which one, but you can see what's on there. All little cabbage worms. There's one, two, three, there's five, there's six of them there. And she's sucking the life force literally from one of them. Now, this is what's interesting to me, even among our people, right? Like people that think this way. I posted this picture when I took it and said, check out lady spider sucking the life force out of the cabbage worms. And I said, look, there's five more cabbage worms. What do you think she's going to do when her meal wears off from the one she's killing right now. Well, she's going to drop his corpse to the ground. He's now fertilizer and she's going to move on. And just like, they don't, they're not real fast critters, man. She's just going to, you're next and suck and he's dead. Right. Somebody actually asked me, so what do you do to control cabbage worms? When I pasted, when I posted this picture, I don't kill those spiders. I don't care. You guys see, they eat some of the leaf there. I don't care. The spider is the lion. OK, the cabbage worm is the plains game. If we kill all the plains game and we protect the lion, what happens to the lions? They leave or they starve to death and die. And then when the plains game come back, they overpopulate. It's the same thing we're doing when we kill them. The number one thing I have found, though, and everywhere I've tried this, it's absolutely shown that there's an explosion of these guys and other spiders in the next season. The number one plant for spiders to overwinter in the dried leaves down in the soil or whatever is apparently comfrey. And wherever I grow comfrey and I don't take the leaves away and I let them kind of, you know, freeze to the ground, I have a spider explosion in that area. Uh, not in a negative way. These little guys here, um, we have some garden orb weavers are real common. Uh, another type of orb weaver that we used to call banana spiders, but they're not really banana spider. Those show up a lot. Uh, we have a tremendous number of cool spiders all over the property. And I'll tell you, we do have black widows show up here. And I do not go out of my way to harm them. If they're in a place where somebody might stick a hand or something, then they got to go. Um, but in general, they're not an aggressive species. And uh, I make room for everybody. We have scorpions here. Uh, they're nothing. You're not going to the ER or anything with, with one of these. Uh, they're called a uh, stripe bark scorpion. They're not a problem either. Stop killing them. Container gardening. Now, I talked about wicking beds a lot, a lot, a lot, because there's a reason. But whether you're doing wicking or not, container gardening is tailor-made for backyards. And there's a one huge advantage to container gardening, as long as you have like a dolly hand truck or you don't make them too big. It's often the case that this spot right here is great to grow your plants in March, April, and May. And then when the real hot weather comes in, really it'd be better to grow them over here. So you pick the container up and you move them. That's a fantastic, easy way to maximize your production based on the time of year and what you're growing and how much sun you want hitting it, how warm you want it to be, et cetera. 
And these are made out of those blue poly barrels that I was talking about. One of the things I think I see a lot of people do is they spend a lot of money on wick, or on wicking bed containers or just containers because you look at this and go, that kind of looks trailer parkish. And I don't mean that in a negative way if you leave in a trailer or anything, but you know what I mean? It looks like it looks like what it is. One of the things we need to realize is our container gardens can be facaded with scrap wood or whatever to look like whatever we want. If we have a lot of stone around, we can build like stone, dry stack stone walls and put our containers inside a facade. There's a big advantage to this beyond just making it pretty. If we have a facade and then we have a container, what's on the container? And I know you're like going, what is this dude talking about? Put it a different way. If that container is sitting out in the open and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, how hot does that container get? The answer, very, right? We're warming up that soil. And now maybe at times of the year we want that, but in our heat of summer, we don't want that. We want to keep soil cool. If it's behind a facade, it has shade on it, and it's measurably, definitively cooler soil, especially at the surface temperature, which is where plants often suffer in our summers. So you have that event. You can move it. You can put it inside facades. It's I don't see anybody building a container garden that couldn't make it into a wicking bed or you know, call it a self-watering container in some way, shape, or form, and I think that you should. I've also seen container gardening done. People get IBCs, cut them in half, flip them over. And so every IBC makes a big wicking bed. They're made to hold water. They work perfect. Again, you can facade them in and make them look like anything that you want. You can do a facade that is a hardscape facade, or you can take and put uh, some sort of trellis up around them, and you can grow any kind of vining crop to cover them with a vine. That's an all-natural way to do it. We get the shade, et cetera grow a vine that loves the sun and it can be productive or it can just be ornamental. Maybe it's something it's most vines are easy to propagate. Maybe it's something we sell for profit, etc. cetera. Um, next, and I want to finish up with this one and then go through some principles, but I'm going to give you another video clip before I do keeping small livestock. A lot of people that live in suburbia think, well, I can't do animals. And depending on your lifestyle, how much work you want to do, maybe you should not. But for instance, I have a good friend. He has turned his backyard into a pond or his backyard pool into a pond, in-ground pool. Uh, he has chickens. He has quail. And he has, um, I can't remember what they're called now, but they're an expensive finch, uh, Lady Godiva finches. He has an aviary inside his house that he runs artificial lights and grows all kinds of really cool productive plants and tropical ornamentals. His quail live in there. And they run around on the ground and they clean everything up and take care of everything. And even indoors, this is an enclosed aviary, but even indoors, he has no smell problems, no nothing. He's building soil in the aviary. He also has chickens that kind of have an inside-outside access. They have what looks like a stone wall in the front of their, one of their windows of their house. The chickens spend most of their time in that little run out there. But if you are uh, a neighbor that's a nosy neighbor with blue hair that wants to complain about chickens, you don't know it's chickens. It's open to the above, but concealed. And so they have chickens, they get eggs, they get compost uh, out of the chickens and the quail. They have quail and everything is done inside or inside outside. That's one example. Quail are super easy to get a egg and a meat yield from. Most backyards, you would be able to tractor quail the way you would do chickens, or you can do chickens as well. You could do bantam chickens, whatever works for you. Um, fish, I consider livestock with your pond systems if you can make them large enough. Worm bins, I consider livestock. Bees, I consider livestock. So one way or another, try to integrate some form of animal-based system into what you're doing. And before we go into principles, I have another uh, video clip I want to play from you. This is also from Jeff Law. And if you can't tell, I really value Jeff and the work that he's done. This is an older video. Uh, this was done on the lead up to his first uh, online PDC permaculture design course. And this is a, a name you may know, Rob Avis, a uh, member of our community as well, really switched on permaculturist. This is in Canada. It really shows what you can do in small spaces. It also shows how to heat a greenhouse with a rocket mass heater. So Paul Wheaton would be happy and proud. Um, and I want to just point one thing out. 
when you hear him mention temperatures here, and he says keep it above zero, it's Canada centigrade. So when he says 40 below, by the way, 40 below, I think that's a crossover point. I think 40 below Fahrenheit and 40 below centigrade are the same temperature. So that that can that can make for, for those of us that speak in Fahrenheit make it a little easy to understand. What he's it's very cold, right? But 32 Fahrenheit is zero centigrade. And I really want you to take a look at all the stuff that Rob's doing here. And again, I'll make sure the full version of this is available to you later on today. Um, left the PRI and just got. I'm at Rob and Michelle Avis's place in Calgary, Canada. So Rob, give us a rundown. Yeah, so we're actually in a, a working class neighborhood in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, uh, north of the 49th parallel, so it's pretty cold up here. And we've been working on this project, which is around 500 square meters or 5,000 square feet for about five or six years now. Um, left the PRI and just got off the ground running as quick as I could. So on this property, we're growing pretty much all of our food, all of our veg, I should say, from June until November. We're about to add some animal systems here in the next six or eight months. Um, we harvest all the water that falls on the property. We've got a solar hot water heating system. And one of the big things that keeps me awake at night living in this climate is the, um, how cold it gets here. I mean, um, we get down to minus 40 on a regular basis. So the first thing that we actually undertook on this property was to retrofit the entire house. So the average home in this neighborhood has about an R value of three or seven. So very, very thin walls. My, my passive solar greenhouse actually is better insulated than most homes in this neighborhood. And so we actually increased the insulation uh, in the home by about a factor of 10, which meant that we've reduced the heating load on the house by about a factor of 10. And actually, I think it was really awesome that I got to be able to work on such a small place because I've had to really focus on the nucleated design of the property. So I've gotten really great at creating super efficient and tight design. Yeah, and it is tight. You've got little water harvesting systems you're picking up different elements everywhere and connecting it all together and that's what's giving you this great sort of efficiency on the site yeah yeah absolutely so we're in the, the passive solar cold climate glass house and you've got a thermal mass rocket stove heat bench so what's what's really interesting about the rocket for folks who've never heard about rocket mass heaters is the entire combustion chamber is built out of refractory brick so you get an extraordinarily high combustion temperature and once this heats up um, the exhaust coming out the back end of this greenhouse looks no different than what a natural gas uh, furnace would look like. So very, very clean combustion gases. Because it's so clean, we can extract all the heat out of this stove as it's running through this two metric ton bench without worrying about creosote or, uh, or soot buildup on the inside of that um, the duct. And after three hours of burning, we can still touch this pipe without any issues because we've extracted all of the heat out of this bench here. Just to tell you that the, the, the rocket stove sucks the air through up into here and back down again. So this is a heat exchanger. It's, up, it's pretty hot right there. It's like a stove. That's fast heat into the air. An air passage, the chimney goes up and down a pipe in the middle, yeah? Yep. And then it goes through the mass that stores the heat in the, in the thermal mass. So this releases the heat quickly. You know, I, that's, you know, I was foolish enough to put my hand on it after it just started the stove. I nearly burnt my hand a second ago. I pulled it off real fast. Uh, it, it, uh, if I put my hand on there now, I get burnt. Right, so that's a very fast heat into the air here. Where this is a slow storage of heat and a slow release of heat in the stove. A it's an engineer, so it's a lot of clever engineering features in this whole thing. <laughs> so the stove is both efficient, we get a very high efficient burn, but it's also really effective because we're utilizing all the, the energy that we're putting into this little system right here. So what this stove actually does is it allows us to, to ensure that the greenhouse stays above zero on really cold nights um, just by charging up this thermal mass. Like in Calgary, we don't usually get red tomatoes even outside in our gardens. They just won't, there's not enough heat to ripen them. 
So typically, if we get the start right um, and we have a good hot summer, we can have red tomatoes in here by the middle of June, 1st of July sort of thing. And so we're the envy of the block. Um, and being that we're in a working class neighborhood, uh, you know, our neighbors can't believe that we're producing cucumbers and tomatoes right at the beginning of the summer instead of not even getting anything at the end of the summer. Something I noticed when we walk around the garden, you've got, you create the surplus of soil. Yes. That's what I'm interested in. This space is actually producing soil as well as vegetables. We would have a look at that. That's a production you don't usually see. Surplus soil from a system and not a big system. How long has it taken to build this? Uh, we have probably half of this every single year. We thought we'd try gravel out um, as a way of, of infiltrating water, but the gravel got inundated with worms. It was basically an in-ground worm system. And uh, the worms are basically shuttling all the organic matter or some of the organic matter from our garden beds and trying to create, I mean, it's just basic entropy really that worms are trying to equalize the bed between the pathway. And, uh, and so the infiltration kind of stopped because the gravel was so full of, of soil. So we excavated all the gravel out and went back to a mulch based system, which gives us more fungi. And I couldn't put the gravel back into the ground anywhere else without extracting the soil. So this is, um, this particular pile is about five years of soil building that the worms were doing in our gravel swales. Well, that's what we started with five years ago, before we started all of our water harvesting and planting systems. Wow. Highly, really tight soils. Three years ago, we uh, sent our, this soil away to the Soil Food Web Lab and uh, they called us back and I've never heard a scientist more excited. Um, they said that we had the best garden soil that they'd ever analyzed. <laughs> so that really means anybody could do this. Anybody, all you need is small space intensity with good design and you can go from that to that and get the best soil that you could possibly. That's, that's a testament. That's, that's a total testament from there to there. So, um, if, if you're on the audio ver so if you're on the audio version, I, I again didn't play the video because it was so visual. I don't think that it would have worked well in the audio, but I'm going to reference it. And again, I think that my reference will work for the audio folks. And again, you can come see the video clip if you wish to. Um, there's a ton in that, but if you notice what if you look at Rob's property, they really don't identify how small it is, but you can see it's not big, and yet they're producing almost all their vegetables uh, from that property and they're building soil at the same time. The greenhouse is an incredible tool done properly. And you can see the way that they attach that to the building itself. They have the aspect so that it's getting the sun from the Southern sky. And they added a rocket mass heater and the rocket mass heater has the upside down barrel like you always see with them and that's a direct radiant high heat pushes through the thermal mass and the thermal mass is a long-term heat personally this is how i feel if i was king instead of president king where you can just make shit happen i would issue an edict and i would say that all not must be because i'm too libertarian to say you know shall be but all new structures built for human habitation in northern climates should have an attached thermally insulated greenhouse on the on the south exposure side of them. Uh, this is how I would advise my subjects if I was king, right, to build their homes in northern climates. Because one, it will help heat the house. Two, I'm not going to get into it today, but you can actually use it to help cool the house in the summer. Yes, that's a thing. Uh, it's what's known as a trombe wall. Uh, it will grow tons of food. And with the addition of a rocket mass heater, not only will it grow vegetables through your winter, again, it will include continuing to heat the house. And there's no reason if you can do it as an attachment to a structure that that thermal mass can't be half in the greenhouse, half in the house. And you can sit your butt on either side and have great comfort and warmth at the same time. Um, it is an incredible way to do things. But what what I found to be more fascinating was the soil building. And for again, those who didn't see the video, basically he began to have soil built where they put gravel. So they had places where they're not growing anything. They don't want grass there. They put gravel down and, and with weed block, I guess. 
And all of a sudden, it became incredibly fertile. And when you dig it up, you got to find the gravel in the soil. And it became a worm, uh, a worm habitat. And the worms were actually migrating organic matter into the gravel. And the gravel, believe it or not, I, I think maybe Rob missed it a bit. It's less that the worms were moving from his garden beds to the gravel. They were just doing their thing under the gravel. And, and people would look at gravel and think that gravel is a place where, you know, it's, it's sterile. And, and, and what I've learned is if you can keep an area moist with gravel, soon the gravel will disappear. The gravel creates kind of an aeration effect and it keeps the soil loose and friable. And every place I've tried to use gravel to have a non-vegetative state, the, and I've even used larger like river rock sized rock for this, like around my pool pump. And all I've done is continuously raise the elevation around. Every time I put rocks in there, grass grows over, critters come, soil builds. So there's an incredible opportunity to build soil here. And that's what I wanted to really talk about as we move into uh, one of my last slides here for you guys today. I think that's this is my last slide. Seven principles. Uh, again, permaculture principles are these overriding philosophies that we use when we design these systems. This, this first one, you know, I pull permaculture principles from the designer's manual, uh, Molisonian principles, Holgramonian principles, Wheatonian principles, Falk principles, etc. From wherever they come, Lottonian principles from Jeff Lawton. This is a Spiritopian principle. I, I've never heard anybody ever quite put it this way. I've heard a lot of talk about building soil, but my primary principle of building soil is kind of similar to what I said earlier about insects. If you want beneficial insects, the first thing to do is stop killing them. If you want to build soil, stop losing it. In fact, I will tell you that if you're not losing soil, you, you will build soil. It's impossible to stop the loss of soil and not have it built. I know that sounds insane, but I'll ask you, have you ever seen somebody abandon a pickup truck just like this thing doesn't run and they just leave it sit and it, it, there's nothing in the back of the truck except metal maybe a bed liner depending on whether it has one or not and a few years later in the back of the truck plants are growing now nobody threw dirt in there nobody planted anything and trees start growing or woody perennials or annual weeds start growing in the back of the truck. Where did it come from? Well, it came from dust being blown into the truck and the truck being impermeable. And over time, since, you know, water can drain out the tailgate or whatever, but overall, basically when it goes in there, unless you get a really good swirling wind, it stays and it starts to build up. And it ends up building up against, you know, the the, the gun walls or the the, the 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 front of the cab or the tailgate. It starts to build up. And then something falls in it that's a seed. Maybe a bird takes a crap in it. And it gets wet during a rain. And it puts a root system in it. It begins to bind up. And then all of a sudden it kind of accelerates. I, I think we've all seen this happen. Uh, an abandoned boat. An abandoned wheelbarrow. A rain gutter that doesn't get cleaned out. Has anybody here in chat ever had to clean out rain gutters that somebody just abused? And when you go up there to clean the gutters out, there's like a, a freaking uh, an acorn starting to grow an oak tree in a freaking rain gutter, right? So if you think about it, this seems like the worst place in the world to grow a plant. You have a rain gutter that's made out of aluminum or, or, or fiberglass, you have a metal truck bed. You have a, a busted-ass aluminum boat. You have a, a tin wheelbarrow or a plastic wheelbarrow. And all of a sudden, nature's like, aha, I have found a vacuum. Boom, and it's growing. Why? Because all of those things have a way by which they cease the loss of soil, even though they start out with zero. So if we use things like micro-earthworks, if we use things like planting our berms. If we use the principle that if it's bare ground, we plant something or we cover it with rock or we mulch it and we stop the soil from migrating off our property to somewhere else, down the so storm drain or whatever, you will build soil. If you do nothing, 
else you will build soil. Now, bringing in mulch, right? Planting uh, crops that nitrify the soil, doing chop and drop, all of those things, using good fertility practices, spraying compost tea, making all that makes it better. But step one, stop the erosion. This is something, and it kind of sickens me that we lock children into classrooms, minimum 13 years of their life, 12 grades plus kindergarten. Some places they grab your kids now in pre-K levels and they have them in there at four or three. Uh, we, we do this in the name of education. And the majority of the things I've told you today or in the other four episodes of this series, you will never learn in school. And the fact I'm about to give you, while we're sitting here programming our children to believe the entire earth is going to end and the, oil, the, the oceans are either going to rise or boil off to the point where they feel like they have no future, and yet we don't teach them what I'm about to tell you makes me sick in my stomach. The single largest export the United States of America has, measured by the ton, is unintentional, and we get nothing for it, and its value is in the billions, if not trillions of dollars. And the thing of it is, you know what it is? It's topsoil. We export through wind and water erosion into our rivers and our streams and our oceans and into the air itself. More topsoil than any other commodity that we produce, period. Think about that. There's a saying, we owe all life on earth to a few inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. Those two things are what sustains life. People say water is life, and I say you're correct. I love water. It's one of my big things. I love water features. I love water in the landscape. It's everything, but it's not the only thing. Soil is as much responsible for life as water. And so we need to, above all things, stop butt cold the exportation of soil off our property. Now, I can't solve the fact. Actually, I can if they would let me for a rounding or error in the national budget. But I don't have the power to cease the metric shit ton of soil and nutrient that goes into, for instance, the Mississippi every, River every year that starts up near the Canadian border and goes all the way to the Mississippi Delta and creates right at the, where Louisiana and the, and the river dumps into the Gulf a giant, huge dead zone every year that keeps growing by you know thousands and thousands of acres, if not miles a year. I can't do that. I know exactly what to do. It's not hard. We could do it, but our society is not matured, has not grown the F up enough yet to take responsibility for this. But what I can do is I can look out at my three acres and say the one damn thing that I'm going to make sure of, if there's anything I can do to stop soil from leaving my property, I'm going to take that step. It is the number one principle. And on small scale, it's easy and it's ridiculously productive, as you saw in the video from Rob Avis. Next principle, do the least work for the highest return. Do the le If you think about something like the, the spindle apples I showed you, you set up irrigation. You put it on automation. I don't care if it's rain catch. I don't care if it comes off. I don't care what it is. But you dig out an area. You plant a row of spindle apples. You prune them twice a year to keep them in that shape. You run irrigation on automation. You mulch the hell out of it. And plant something like comfrey in between all the trees. Maybe also go down there and plant something like goji berry or bush cherry so you have a second yield. You go out. You pick apples. You prune the trees. You don't really do much else. You're growing in a vertical space. You're maximizing production. Again, if you have a 10-foot spindle apple in a one-foot strip, now you have 70 square feet of production, and you're doing a very small amount of work. If you want to go back to the first principle and build soil, by preventing erosion, you do work one time, and you build soil forever. Because if, if nature can build soil in a rain gutter or a boat, or the back of a pickup truck, or an abandoned wheelbarrow, or whatever the hell else people leave lying around, and it does, then on an actually well-designed property, that one hit of work is going to keep paying dividends 
your house will rot to the ground. Trees will grow through it in the abandonment of our suburbs at some point. And the work you do to stop soil erosion, if you do it properly, will continue to work. And trees will take over where we live today, eventually, in some places, right? Next, everything should serve multiple functions. We call this dun, 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 function stacking. If I'm going to do a vertical growth on a wall, and that wall gets a lot of sun, and I'm going to do that because I want to take the residual heat of that wall and help to grow something that likes heat, like let's say figs in a more northern climate. I get the space. I get the fig tree, right? I get the residual warmth. But what else do I do? Do I want it hot or cold in my house in the summer? I want it cool. Now the fig tree is shading the wall. That's one example of function stacking. If you look at one of my systems being the pond that's behind my duck house, it grows fish. That's a function. It provides water for plants that grow terrestrially. That's a function. It grows aquatic vegetation that provides for composting. That's another function. That same vegetation provides feed for my ducks and my chickens. That's another function, right? It also grows crops that are aquatic crops like duck potato that I can personally eat. That's another function. It grows um, ornamental crops like water irises that I like to look at because they're pretty. That's another function. Because it grows them, they propagate. I can sell them or give them away to other people. That's another function. And it just keeps going. And that was all done intentionally. It was also done with about nine years of experience saying, now that I know everything I can do with aquatics, here we go. But all you really have to do, whenever you say, I'm going to do a thing, I'm going to implement this technique, then you just get, you take that technique and you do what we've talked about earlier. You get tactical. What else can this technique be leveraged to do? What are the connections? Next, and you guys have heard this over and over again, the problem is the solution. If it's properly harnessed, remember the problem can also be the problem. But if we start, in many instances, I think this maybe is not phrased perfectly. The problem is the solution. I, I think maybe sometimes the problem itself is the solution, but often the problem points the way to the solution. So if we look at the problem properly, and instead of being angry at the problem, instead of thinking we must destroy the problem, we say, what does this problem indicate? So let's say that we are growing something that is a relatively heavy nitrogen feeder like peppers. And we look at our pepper plants and our pepper plants have kind of some chlorosis, a little bit of yellowing in the leaves. Well, that's a problem. Uh, we don't want to over fertilize preppers, but we don't want to under fertilize them either. And they're not going to be productive. But what's the real problem? Are our peppers nitrogen deficient or is our soil nitrogen deficient? Now, what if we know full well there's enough nitrogen in that soil? We've used an organic fertilizer or something like that. And we still have yellowing pepper leaves. Well, what we have is we don't have enough life in the soil that the, the, the whole symbiosis of the system is working. So the nitrogen deficiency that peppers experience isn't a soil nitrogen deficiency. It's showing us that we don't have enough life in our soil. So then we need to add mulch. Maybe we need to add something like dry molasses. Maybe we need to do compost tea. It's pointing to the solution. Next, diversity. Okay, diversity. And we have gotten to a point today where people love the word diversity so much that they just want as much diversity as possible in everything that they do. I've even heard people like that actually speak this way. Well, when I got chickens, I wanted a multiracial chicken flock. There's only one race of chickens. There's different, there's different breeds. <laughs> there's one race. They're all chickens. Okay. Um, and that's fine. And I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying like diversity for diversity's sake is not a good way to run a society, a community, or a garden. Diversity is valuable for the interconnections and the interoperability and the internal and interrelationships that it creates. So if I just plant a billion things, I might end up with only a few being productive and their production being limited by the other things that are non-productive. If I plant a lot of diversity, I might be able to then select that which will grow best or I might need be then able to identify like I planted chives everywhere, but they grew really well here. So I'm not going to keep trying to get them to grow over here. I'm going to let nature point the way. 
Or do these things create interrelationships that are valuable? If I grow a thing and it's not really good for humans, but it brings in pollinators, that's good for humans and, and wildlife too. If I plant a thing that I don't eat, but my livestock does, that's good for me because now I'm feeding my livestock. So diversity is great, but why? What diversity for what purpose to what end with tactic and technique in mind? Then slow spread and soak water and hence nutrients. This is something on large permaculture designs. We put in ponds, dams, mainframe swells, et cetera, hugel beds, all types of things that makes it happen. We tend to overlook it when it comes to our small scale designs with those micro earthworks. You should look at your property and think, where does the water flow? How do I slow that flow? Spread it along contour and soak it in. You do that, you go back to principle one. You're going to build soil because you're going to stop erosion, butt cold. But at the other side, you're going to charge up your aquifer. Your property over time, especially small scale properties done properly, will literally become drought proof. Over the years, you will put so much hydration into your soils that you will begin to actually raise your local, and you, this even can be done on very small properties, like quarter acre properties, you can literally begin to raise the water table. At least the, the, the sometimes there's multiple water tables. There's the water table that is kind of like, you wouldn't put a well into it. It's kind of like where you're not going to pump water, but if you dig down there, it's always moist. And then lower, you'll have that water you could put a well into. That first one, you can literally begin to go deeper with it at first. And at some point, it will actually begin to build upward. And as soon as it gets to the point where it's always moist, and specifically your perennials roots are deep enough to touch that, you're drought proof in all but the worst droughts. And a little bit of irrigation at that point goes a long way. And now your irrigation is not wasted. Not only have you stopped the erosion of your soil, when you irrigate what soaks in, and it doesn't leave because you stopped the erosion, what soaks in hits that layer and stops descending. And it's still watering your plants, at least your perennials. Next, this is like my most important thing that I, I, I want to finish up with you guys. And this is hopefully through this whole series, you've begun to really see that this is true. Humans are native to planet Earth. We are natural beings. We are nature. We belong here. We belong on this planet as much as a green tree frog or a copse tree frog or a black rat snake or a kangaroo or a deer or an elk or an elephant or a bumblebee or a honeybee or a dragonfly or a bat. We belong here. This idea that we are somehow to stay apart from nature is insane. It is a pathway to the destruction of all humankind and the planet. Green Country Agroforester here says humans are a keystone species. Yes, we actually impact the environment around us and we can cause collapse or we can cause incredible stability. The danger of teaching people that humans should live in this urban sprawling scape of hell and then there should be farms and then there should be nature wilderness and then we should stay away from there except maybe go look at it a little bit on the outskirts a little trail goes around the bob marshall wilderness and we stay out of the mountains only the the do the great white hunters can go in there once a year or something like that it's asinine it's asinine it's one of the dumbest things it's another one of those things that like the, the fact that we don't teach our children in school about conserving topsoil and how bad the problem is. Another thing we teach our kids in school is the separation the, uh, idea. If we are part of nature and we have this higher level of reasoning and thought, then it becomes natural for us to say, well, how do I use it to be a positive force for nature? If you convince me I'm not part of nature, well, then that is a license to be a complete pig slaw. And say, okay, there's systems designed to deal with me. Like I'm some space alien invader of the planet. And they can bury my shit and bury my stuff and, and flush my pee into a septic system or whatever. And all the garbage I produce, that needs to be handled in some sort of magical way that I don't understand. 
and I don't have to worry about things and I can just hire true green Kemlon to spray my grass so it stays greener. You know, screw it. That's too much work. Let's get AstroTurf lawns put in. Like I'm seeing all the commercial operations now, they're going to plastic grass. All the Costco's have plastic grass in the parking lots, uh, fake trees, whatever. And then all this incredible opportunity that we just talked about today. And I hope you see it that way. Incredible opportunity is lost. It's lost. It's discarded. It's wasted. We should be creating habitat for species, including species that are at risk right in the suburbs, right in downtown areas, on rooftop gardens, on buildings. I've heard people poo-poo the whole gardening on industrial rooftops because we can only feed 4 or 6% of the population with that. Maybe we should do the 4 to 6%, but we're also missing something. What's the impact? When we turn a roof into a green roof, how much less energy does that building use? The answer is about 15%. If we just do, if we don't do anything but the roof, it's about 15%, right? And then if it's only 4 to 6%, that's a 4 to 6% drop in the need to do conventional agriculture out where it's acceptable to do in our mindset. So now we can take that that yeah, four to six to eight, maybe 10%, depending on what we really can do with these opportunities. And we can take that agricultural land and now the farmer can afford to give that land up to put in riparian areas, to put in USDA code 600 agricultural terraces that they can get a subsidy to do or a grant to do. We call those swales in permaculture. When you talk to a farmer, you call them USDA code 600 agricultural terraces. Because that's a language they speak. They know how to work that system. We, we can start going into civil pasture systems with that 6 to 10%. Because we don't need it to produce more chemically sprayed crap. Well, then we can start to actually restore habitat for animals and insects in urban, suburban areas, but also in agricultural areas. And we can start filling our proper role. We are not supposed to be a damaging species to the planet. We are, but it's only because we don't live the way that we're supposed to live. I think it makes sense that any being should be doing something for its own existence. And how much are we doing for our existence when we sit in a cubicle and analyze marketing data every day and tell the guy over in direct mail how to target the direct mail? That earns an income. It is productive from that standpoint, but it doesn't do anything to see to your own needs. The calories that have to go in your body, the clean water that has to go in your body, the cleansing of the air that you pollute, like it doesn't do anything for that. But that same guy can come home, maintain a property like we talked about today, and he's actually contributing to the betterment of the planet. This is this is not just something we should do. I think we should feel called to do it, but we should actually feel we should feel inspired to do it. We should feel blessed that we get to do it. And I, I'm going to tell you, I've never turned anybody on to this and had them actually start doing it and never quit. Once they start, once they they begin to do it, once they get a result from it, when they look at it and they see it and they feel it and they know it, they're hooked forever. They can't stop. And I've seen it start with somebody putting in a couple raised bed, self-watering beds you buy at Walmart made out of plastic. And somebody craps all of That's plastic. Shut up. They're, they're typing their comment on a plastic keyboard, bitching about the person using plastic to grow food. Shut up. I mean, really, if that's you and you made it this long to me, I'm shocked. But shut up. And I've seen people start that way and they have three of them. And then they're like, I need to grow more food. This, this. This soil that comes in a bag that fills these things up is expensive and it gets hot in the sun. And what do I do? Well, let's put a bed in. Let's put a pond in. Let's let's start trellising up the side of your house. I grew a cucumber and it grew over the side of this thing. And then the, you know, the dogs peed on it. Well, let's trellis it up the side of your house. And they're hooked. And there's a reason. I believe that something that happens to humans in general, it happens with a lot of things, not just permaculture. When the person finds their path. And we, I don't think we, well, I don't think each of us has a path. I think we have multiple paths. We live a long time. You know, there's not many, there's not many things that live longer than us 
especially terrestrial things, things that live on the, you know, the, the land, got certain whales and stuff in the ocean. When we look on land, we've got like elephants, tortoises. I don't know if there's any, I'm going to probably miss something here, but there is not a lot of things that are animals. We get trees, but there's not a lot of animals that live longer than humans. We live a long time. And from the time we're like 10 years old, we have the capacity to garden, to grow things, to manage ecosystems. And until we get to the point where we really can't, I mean, I've seen elderly people still doing this in their 80s or 90s, and it keeps them young and it keeps them alive. We have this opportunity. Our dash, I always talk about how your dash gets smaller every day and don't waste it, leave a legacy, et cetera, make the most of it. And it does shorten every day. And it's good to think about that. It's also good to think about how damn long it is. The average person in the world today, if you say that they can start having some measurable contribution, I believe younger, but some measurable contribution at the age of 10 to our ecosystems. And that they can maintain that to 80. Seven freaking decades. And there's Billions of us. Billions. Billions of people, seven decades of impact on the planet. And here's the kicker. In those seven decades, you are going to have an impact on the planet. If you live as a Starbucks yuppie and you never plant anything, you have plastic grass, you live in a, 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 a condominium, you ride your bike to work so you think you're being ecological, you go get your avocado toast. No understanding of the food miles that go into that. Thanks, Dale. for the Dale's Quails, thanks for the $20 super chat. You do that your whole life. You have an impact for seven decades doing that. Quite a negative one. And it's let's say it's not that negative. Let's say it's not that negative. It's still a tremendous waste because there's a word that gets lost in the vernacular. This is another, this is a phrase that it makes me sick that we don't teach our children in school. I know I didn't learn this phrase all the way through 12th grade. And I took some like AP classes and stuff like that. Opportunity cost. When you don't have your money, because it was taken from you, even if you get it back later, like social security, you lose the opportunity that you, like you could have built a business with that. You could have invested in something with a better return than SSI. That's an opportunity cost. It's financial. We think money, so it's easy to understand. Every year, you don't plant a tree. It's an opportunity cost. If you planted 10 trees a year, just 10 trees a year, on your own land, on other people's land, whatever, 10 trees a year, so the time you were 10 years old, so the time you were 80 years old, 700 trees. Every one you don't plant is an opportunity cost. If you could make some little simple changes to your backyard, even if you don't go full permaculture, if you could just make the changes that stop soil erosion and you don't do it, that is something the opportunity cost goes beyond your own life. You could have done it once and at last you're dead. Your house burns to the ground. It rots. People abandon the neighborhood. It's still, those earthworks are still going to function. That opportunity cost is gone. We are native, natural species to this planet, and we are as much a part of nature and wilderness as every other creature. We just need to grow up and not learn it. We need to remember it. When I said that you already know how to do all these things I'm talking about, I meant it. It's etched into your ancestral memory. We have ancestral memories. We're born with them. I'm not even talking like metaphysical crap here. I'm just saying this is how genetics work. This is, it can be a negative. There are things we instinctually fear, like illness and disease. Maybe because, you know, two thirds to three quarters of the population got wiped out at one time by what we call the Black Plague. And there's probably other things like that. There's a bottleneck in civilization where humans barely made it through it that way predates that. And so we have those 
negative ancestral echoes or memories in our system. But there's a reason that if you know nothing about gardening and I go into one of my garden beds that's been in production for five or six years and I pull back the mulch and I take the soil out and I show it to you, you know it's good. No one has to tell you what good soil is supposed to look like. You look at it and that crap that Rob Davis had that he saved from when he first started on his property that lumped crap together. It looks like dog turds, like petrified dog turds. It's supposed to be soil. You know that's bad. How do you know that? If you've never been taught any of this, how do you know that? And you do. Show it to an eight-year-old kid and say, which one of these looks better? They'll pick the right one every time. How do they know that? How do you know that? How do you look at some things, some plants, and go, that's probably edible? And you look at some plants and go, I probably shouldn't eat that. And then you look at another plant and go, that probably won't hurt me, but it probably isn't going to taste good. How do you know that? How does somebody that's never seen a blackberry before look at a blackberry bush that has berries that are white, red, and black and know immediately, hey, those black ones are probably the ripe ones? And even if you're not sure, is red ripe and you touch it and it's hard and you touch the black one and it's got a little give to it, you might even taste the red one, but you already know you already know one's going to be bitter and one's going to be sweet. How do you know that? You know it the same way that the cow knows to eat the grass. You know it the same way that the squirrel knows to put away the nut. Squirrel mommies and daddies do not teach baby squirrels what nuts to eat. They go out and figure it out. They know. Little baby spiders, after they hatch, send up a little stream of silk and fly away in the wind. Mommy spider doesn't teach them that. How do they know that? It's an eight to the species. And another way to say that is it's ancestral memory. That's what we have. And that's a big part of what permaculture allows us to reclaim. I've got some starred stuff. I want to go through it fast because I do need to wrap up. We're at an hour and 50 minutes here. W. Kemp says, recommendation for good organic bag compost you can get at major retailers if there are any. All my bulk options are hours away, and renting a dump truck is pretty expensive. I don't have a brand name recommendation. I have a process recommendation to attempt to avoid any sort of residual icky gick, uh, specifically residual herbicides. I would pick something that seems good. Buy a bag of it, okay? Take a couple handfuls of it, put it in the bottom of a five-gallon bucket. And I do this with mulches too, like straws and stuff. Soak it in the water for a couple days and then drain the water off. Get a pot, two little pots, plant beans in both of them. And make sure you just can't grow, you're not growing beans like crap. And take some known good stuff and grow beans in both of them. Water one with whatever you use to water your garden. Water the other with the water that came from soaking the compost or mulch material. Wait till the beans are starting to grow before you do this, right? So go ahead and plant your beans before you even do the soak. But then just irrigate with the, the water from the soak. If you have any sort of herbicide, it will plumb, mess up a legume like that quick. But don't do it with just one, because if you do it with just one, maybe you just had bad seed or bad soil. or So everything the same, the only difference is where the water comes from. That's my best way to screen this, because I can't give you a guaranteed name brand to do. Best thing to do, of course, is make your own compost. And I know you say bulk's hard to come by. Bulk compost is generally not the best. Bulk is generally made at way too high of a temperature. And that's one of the problems, even with the stuff that comes in the bag. And then you get this really high temperature compost. It's knocked out all the beneficial microorganisms. In a season, it will come back around and it will be fine. But you don't have the soil biology going because you've it's been composted at like 180 degrees instead of like have a maximum temperature of 160. And 150, 160 is kind of your sweet spot at the high level for your composting. But what you can often find is wood chips. And if you put down enough wood chips, nature will take it over from there and then make your own compost. Um, next up, Vincent says, I have a 50-foot raised beds on a 30% grade facing south, 
uh, inch wide, 50 foot long, gravity feed spring water. Do you have any thoughts on vegetables that should be on the lowest or highest roast? I don't. I have no idea. You're going to just have to let nature tell you. But obviously, the higher ups are going to be things that can handle more dry. And then your lower stuff is going to be things that need more moisture. And what I can help you with is probably a counterintuitive thing. Your drier soils are great for tomatoes. Tomatoes actually are a desert species originally. And they actually like the one of the reasons people have problems with tomatoes is actually overwatering. Now they need moisture, uh, but that would be a, a place to start there. Ron says, Jack, what about adding salamanders and polywogs to aqua aquaponics? Um, you can, your fish will probably eat them uh, unless you have like a separate place for them. The salamanders are just nice to have. They're kind of cool. They may eat some stuff, but um, your garden ponds are going to be better for that uh, type of thing. And if you do aquatics on your property, like I told you the story about my buddy Byron and the toad invasion, you probably won't have to. Nature will send them. But I am a big fan of like if i see a thing and there's no uh, governmental prohibition that i'm going to get in trouble for and it's a beneficial thing and i can capture it bringing it to my property if i'm somewhere and i see fence lizards uh or i see a knolls which are little green lizards or some sort of frog species or something like that that i think i would be cool on my property mediterranean geckos etc I will capture them and put them in a shirt pocket or something, and I will bring them home. I've always been like that. What options are there to keep dogs out of small ponds, or is it even necessary from Trekkie Gal? Yeah, probably. Uh, one is to just train them not to if you can. If they're drinking water out of your pond and things like that, it's not a problem. If they're getting in, that usually is a problem because it disturbs things. Um, my dogs are not a problem now with ponds. In the beginning, when Charlie was a puppy – Everything in the pond had to be taken out and chewed upon, like, you know, a container growing water uh, lily pads had to be pulled out and eaten. So I had and he had to jump in them and swim around in them and stuff. So I had to I actually had to put fencing around some of my ponds due to that problem. So you either fence or train the dog. And, and those are really your only two options. And training a dog to stay out of a thing takes patience and time an understanding of the canine mind. And this is not an episode on dog training, but it can be done if that's what you need to do. Question, thermal mass and freezing. That's not a question. That's a statement. I don't understand the question. But if you have enough thermal mass, you stave off freezing. I really, you got to be more specific than that, guys. Christopher says, is there really heavy metal in human biomass? A guest of yours said so last week, but I thought the problem with alpha predators, humans, is that we accumulate heavy metals and don't expel it. Um, so heavy metals in our biomass. So when we poo, do we expel by, uh, heavy metals if we're consuming them? Sure. Do we expel all of them? No, that's part of the problem. That doesn't have anything to do with if we're making compost out of sewage, are there heavy metals in there? There's all kinds of ways that heavy metal ends up in our sewage treatment, including our storm drains and things like that. So... Um, the idea that we never expel a heavy metal is a fantasy. The concept that we retain it for a very long period of time and we can build it up is a reality. So, um, that's a different situation. Now, if we're using human manure and we're using it on our own and we're using like composting toilet systems or whatever, I, that's the last thing that I'm worried about there. Uh, if there are heavy metals in soil, will plants necessarily absorb it and become tainted? Follow up on that question. The answer is most of the time, no. And Jeff Lawton explained this to me. So let's say you have something in your soil that you really don't want to be consuming a lot of a heavy metal like cadmium. Now, your plant doesn't want cadmium. It's not going to absorb cadmium. It's not going to intentionally absorb lead though it's easier for it to take up some lead than it is some cadmium. But in general, unless there's a huge amount of these toxins in our soil, plants tend not to take them up. They certainly don't want to eat them. But they might be forced into drinking them. If the pH of your water and your soil is low enough, i.e. acidic enough, but generally you're getting into such acidic levels 
that you have other problems before you get there. I, I'm not going to say if there was a pile of lead acid batteries dropped in an area for 20 years, clear out the batteries, don't worry about any remediation and grow in it. But I'm going to say in general, this is not something you need to spend a lot of time worrying about. And nature's amazing at its ability to lock things up. But the research on that, this is why a few weeks ago when I talked to Paul Wheaton, who I think is probably who's being referenced here, and his whole thing about there is no commercial compost anywhere ever that doesn't have uh, persistent herbicides in it. Because I know this girl that bought some one time and ended up with it. That's like, I know this thing that happened in this one place where a thing went like it. So any place where anything similar to that thing happens, it will be the same. It's a, it's a nonsensical assertion. If you want to say there's always that risk, sure. But the reality is that most toxins in healthy soil systems are eventually locked up with natural processes. And this happens extremely fast in aquatic systems. Um, there are things that persist beyond that, like PCBs in some of our, our uh, water systems and mercury in some of our water systems. But most things that we worry about, we worry way too much and we act way too little. Cassie says, suggestion for grading a, the pond climate in a high desert, or rural northeastern Utah, high elevation and very dry. The drier you are, the deeper your water feature and the lower the surface area relative to depth you're looking for. That's step one. Go deep and narrow relative to depth. At, I don't care if it's a huge pond. I don't care if it's a quarter acre pond, still deep relative to your surface area. Two, shade. Shade. Shade prevents evaporation. Three, top cover in the hot part of your month. So some sort of floating vegetation. So we're talking shade above for at least part of the day. Plus we're shading the surface. Next, have some way, you know, we're talking small ponds. So well or rain catch water to replenish the pond to keep it at a level that works. Those are your your primary things, and that's what I can do in the amount of time that I have today. Um, Victor says, is it wise to cut down trees that block all south sun in very wooded property? My four and a half acre property is rocky and hilly. Only flat land is 1.5 acres, and it's too shady. You definitely want to, if you want to grow things that need sun, then you're going to have to sacrifice some trees. And so what I would do is look for the lowest quality timber or the highest now, how does that work? Low quality, young regrowth, not a lot is lost, and we can still leave some trees and create glade environments so we have some shade. Right? That would be one option we can do. Two, if we're putting it like even an acre and a half, you can put a if if the ground's right, you put a lot of surface water. If you cut down some trees, but you put in a pond, nature's kind of at a net gain still if you do it smartly, right? Now, high quality timber. Why would I say that? Well, if I need lumber, if I can use the timber and I take out my high quality timber and I use it for building, if I didn't do that, somebody somewhere else was going to cut down high quality timber that I was going to buy. So it's it's a one for one exchange. It's And thinking differently is like the person that buys the electric car, but all their power comes from a coal generation electrical power plant. Right. And so the energy being produced to charge their car that comes from coal, a cogeneration plant, right, is really dirty, but they have no exhaust. Where if the car ran on gasoline, it, it will probably have a lower emission than the energy that's being generated from coal, because as bad as oil is, coal is worse. Coal is the most disgusting, repulsive fuel that we have in mining, extraction, what it leaves behind, and in its burning. So when we think, well, if I cut this tree down, that's bad. But if I go to the store and buy lumber, that's good. We're thinking the same backwards way. So we're either going to use the opportunity in clearing where we need to clear to get high quality timber, or we're going to take scrub growth that doesn't have that much value. And we don't want to clear cut. And what we should do in these places where we're making the decision to remove trees in order to grow things, only remove enough to do the thing you're ready to do now, 
Because what's going to happen eventually, you're going to realize I don't need an acre and a half of garden. You know, I need a 20th an acre of garden, and maybe I need to open up a 10th to get a 20th of grow space. So only take what you need to do what you need to do as you need to do it and put water features in wherever you can. Where else can I find that video clip and more? Again, I put up an audio version of all of these lessons on my podcast. It goes out in the podcast feeds like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, all that. And where that's held on the blog, all the resources are always put there for you. It just usually takes about an hour after the live version ends, which is coming up really soon. Can duckweed be dried and used as feed from Bill? Probably, but it takes a lot of duckweed to add up to anything. Most people that I know that save duckweed for feed freeze it. Um, you can certainly dry it. And you could cut it with other things and you could even put it through like a pelletizer and you could make a pelleted feed using it. It just is not usually as productive as people seem to think it's going to be. It doubles every day. First of all, it usually doesn't. Second of all, it's still when it dries up, it is a fraction of its size. I don't see any more all caps for questions uh, from what's come in. Uh, we got one comment here from Eka Mouse Jack. Awesome classroom. Thanks for sharing all the info and charisma. Thank you, Eka Mouse, for your kind words, and thank you for being here so frequently. I appreciate everybody that's been here with us today. Uh, this does wrap up this five-part series, and that means I'm going to probably button it in and use it to learn the learning management software um, for uh, the course that I'm going to be putting out, specifically the course I'm going to be putting out on aquatics. But I'm going to take this whole thing and make it a free course that people can take and learn what it's like to have me as an instructor, maybe put some quizzes with it and stuff like that so you can go through it again and you can share it with people that want to learn this stuff. Um, I want to say something here at the very end. I am going to put out a course that's going to cost money. And I do run a, a monetization format for my podcast. So like everybody else, I can make a living. And when I put the aquatics course out, I'm going to charge for it because it is... My God, it was weeks of work just to write the syllabus for it, just the outline, let alone actually producing it. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. And it's it, it's it's nine years of acquired knowledge doing work that, honestly, not many other people are doing. And so I do need to monetize things like anybody else, just like you guys work for a living. I, I, I have to have some way to do that. But in the end, I try to put out as much free information as is possible. Because I believe that if we're going to make a positive impact on society, th this stuff is critical. And I actually think that hoarding knowledge is anti-human. I'm not just going to say it's wrong or it's evil. It's just it's not what humans are about. And I want you to think about it this way. Have you ever found out something really cool. And maybe it's even something that is a really good skill or something good to know or something really productive. Like when you find out about it, you're like, this is awesome. What's the first thing you want to do? Tell somebody. Tell me you haven't had that day where like you learn a thing and you're like, you call your best friend, dude, dude, you got to know this thing, right? Like, or, or that, like you don't see somebody doing a thing and like they miss something, right? They miss something that they could be doing. And then you're like, hey, did you know? Like I have never found a great golf teacher that can stand by and watch somebody at a driving range suck and not say, hey, can I give you some advice? We are innately information sharers, mentors, and teachers. And I try so hard to always remember that and to just pour it out every opportunity that I get for you guys. But the important thing is that you show up and you learn and you do things with it. And so while I do monetize things, and that is a necessary thing in our, in our current world, this is not Star Trek. We're not post-scarcity yet and we'll, probably won't be in my lifetime. Um, at the same time, we need to never be stingy with knowledge. We never, never hold back knowledge. And there's two huge paydays that I get that have nothing to do with money. 
in doing this teaching and this podcast. Payday one is the emails that come in and say, look what I've done. I built a business. I built a garden. I taught my whatever. My kids are doing this now. Anything where or I was prepared and the storm came and the power went out and we didn't lose our food. Anything like that. Here's my garden. Here's my pond. Here's whatever. Huge payday. Because I know that what I've said was put into practice and benefited somebody. The one that's even bigger, when I find out I created a teacher, when I find out that someone is out there going into other, like not necessarily on a YouTube channel, being, you know, me or Justin Rhodes or Jeff Lawton or somebody or Matt, uh, what's, I can't think of his last name now. Uh, the, the guy that does the stuff for kids. He's been on my show, Matt, whatever his name is, right? Or Mark Shepard, like not even necessarily that, but like the guy that's just like, yeah, I went over to my neighbors and I taught him how to put a garden in. Holy crap. That's the most important thing in the world to me. Because I do believe this is what we are innately as a species. We are people that are designed to live with nature and to share information. And try to keep that in mind. So please share this, this series. Please share the work that I do. And please take from it freely and above all, do something with it. And with that, friends, uh, it's been another great episode. We've wrapped up this series and uh, I'm really going to pour it on now into the aquatics course before anybody asks, probably June, probably June when it will be available. You won't miss it. It won't be like only 100 people get to sign up or something like that. It's going to be a very scalable thing. I will catch you guys tomorrow. We have an interview tomorrow. Those of you that show up tomorrow, you'll hear an interview with Charles Mayfield. He is a regenerative farmer, and he's going to talk to us about what he's doing with his land, with pigs, and skin care. Yep, farming for skin care. You'll find out about that tomorrow. Take care, guys.